the introduction. I am happy to share with you a project involving the use of meta-analysis to inform on the performance of bioanalytical methods. This is a standard FDA disclaimer for my talk. Today, I will describe the type of bioanalytical data submitted to FDA, explore the utility of meta-analysis on bioanalytical data, give an example of an FDA inspection that used meta-analysis, identify benefits and limitations of meta-analysis, and finally, discuss future steps for using such approach. Bioanalysis occurs in silos. Companies independently create methods and rarely share them with other companies. And for good reason. You don't share vital business information with your competitors. Now you can find methods published in the literature, but oftentimes these publications lack crucial information about the method. Generally, if a method is fit for purpose and validated per agency guidance, the method is not likely to be improved unless there's a business need or a new regulatory expectation. But what if the FDA could inform on the performance of your method by comparing it to other similar methods submitted to drug applications? Would you improve your method if you discovered that it needed refinement? And what if you discover that your method performed better than the other methods reported to FDA? Wouldn't it be nice to know this information from a business and operational perspective? But the good news is that the FDA has a mountain of bioanalytical data from drug applications. Just how much data are we talking about? Well, consider there are thousands of generic drugs available in the marketplace. And that for every generic drug, the FDA likely received multiple applications from different sponsors. And that each one of those applications likely contains bioanalytical data from at least two studies. Now that's a lot of data. The question is, can we leverage that bioanalytical data to inform on method performance and perhaps the conduct of FDA inspections? Now this slide shows you the typical bioanalytical data that are found in abbreviated new drug applications, also known as ANDAs. Now the ANDAs are usually supported by pharmacokinetic endpoint bioequivalent studies, which are conducted in healthy volunteers under fed or fasted conditions. Each one of the studies contains two portions. There's a clinical portion, which involves subject screening, enrollment, randomization, dosing, and monitoring of adverse events, among other aspects. There's also an analytical component, which involves the analysis of subject samples for the measurement of dose concentrations. Now, each of these analytical portions has a method validation report, a bioanalytical report, and concentration data sets. As you might imagine, these documents contain a wealth of information about the bioanalytical method, including but are not limited to instrument information, sample processing techniques, personnel involved in the method, and lastly, the reagents used by the method. But how do we use this information? We can begin by assessing intra and inter method performance when we conduct a meta analysis. For instance, we can benchmark results from all the methods. We can look at the expected dynamic range for the drug of interest. We can look at sensitivity of the methods as well as the precision and accuracy of those methods. We could profile analyte behaviors look at the stability of the analyte in aqueous and biological media across the methods. We can also look at matrix effects. And we can also map good outputs, areas of concern, and possible sources of error among the methods. Here's a recent example of an FDA inspection which used meta-analysis. I conducted this inspection. The assignment involved one company one bioequivalent study and one bioanalytical method. Now, prior to the inspection, I searched FDA databases and found six other similar methods for the same analyte. These methods were validated by different companies and submitted to independent drug applications. So I had a total of seven methods to compare. 
The meta-analysis focused on in-study method performance. That means on the component of analyzing the study subject samples. The reason I did that is because I personally believe that you are more likely to see errors with your method when you analyze subject samples versus when you're validating your method. The four components that I chose include subject sample reanalysis, fail runs, which contain subject samples, anchored sample reanalysis, or ISR, and lastly, the performance of quality control samples uh, in the runs, which contain study subject samples. So let's have a look at results from these four components. This table shows general information about the seven LCMS-MS method characteristics. I audited method number one, which is shown in red. The first component evaluated was study sample reanalysis. In this histogram, the y-axis shows the number of samples reanalyzed among methods. The methods are shown on the x-axis. The red bar is method one, that is the method I inspected. The blue bars are the other methods which were compared. Now, as you can see, method one had the highest number of reanalyzed samples among all the methods. This is as high as 15% of all the study samples received by the company. Now, let's look at the reasons for sample reanalysis. The histogram has three axes. The y-axis shows the number of reanalyzed samples. The x-axis shows the reasons for reanalysis. And the z-axis shows the methods being compared. Again, the red bars show results from method number one. You can see that method one had more issues with unacceptable internal standard response variability, poor chromatography, and instrument errors than the other six methods. A little later, I will expand on these three issues. The second component I evaluated was the number of fell runs. Again, the red column represents method one. You can see that method one had the most fail runs which contain subject samples among the methods. Let's look at the reasons for fail runs. For method one in red bars, the reasons included instrument errors, poor chromatography, unacceptable internal standard response variability, as well as precision and accuracy issues. The third component was ISR. The red bar is method one. And based on the count shown in the y-axis, method one had the second highest number of ISR samples that failed the acceptance criteria. However, it's worth mentioning that all the methods met the overall incurred sample reanalysis criteria as specified in the FDA guidance document. The fourth and last component was quality control sample performance among all methods. The graph is different from the previous graphs in that it shows quality control sample results from all the runs containing subject samples for each method, which are shown on the y-axis. The x-axis shows you the percent deviation from nominal quality control sample concentration. The allowable deviation is plus or minus 15% from nominal concentration, as represented in the vertical blue bar. Any individual quality control sample result falling outside of the blue bar fell the acceptance criteria. The black dots are the individual quality control sample results. The red circle shows you the results from method number one. You can see that most of the black dots fell within the blue bar and met acceptance criteria. Now, interestingly, you can scan across all the methods and look at the individual results and for the most part, they look similar. However, you do notice some differences. For instance, method number five within the blue circle shows that the individual results are packed tighter within the blue bar. And for method number seven, all the quality control samples fell within the blue bar and are packed even tighter. Now, this could possibly indicate that method number seven and number five were a little more reliable than method number one at measuring quality control sample concentrations. Looking deeper at quality control sample performance in method one, you notice that some individual results 
shown as black dots, fell the acceptance criteria at the high quality control sample level. And these are highlighted within the red circle. Now the possible concern here is that perhaps the method is not as reliable when it comes to measuring high drug concentrations compared to the lower concentrations of QC samples. Now I don't have subject sample concentrations to share with you, but I can tell you that all of them were below the high quality control level. So the finding, in my opinion, uh, did not really impact the reliability of the measured subject sample concentrations. In summary, from a meta-analysis perspective, among all seven methods, method one had the highest number of reanalyzed samples, the highest number of failed runs, the second highest number of samples which failed ISR criteria, and possibly some issues with measuring the high quality control samples. But as I indicated earlier, all the subject sample concentrations were contained below the high quality control samples. From an inspection perspective, there were no objectionable conditions. I was able to confirm instrument errors, poor chromatography, and excessive internal standard response variability. These three issues led to the high number of reanalyzed samples and the high number of fail runs. What are the benefits and limitations of using meta-analysis to evaluate bioanalytical data? Starting with limitations, you're dealing with different companies who operate differently, so the information you receive is not going to be uniform. The methods are not identical. There are some differences in materials and method parameters, including but not limited to different columns, different mobile faces, different instrument brands, and different internal standards. Lastly, you could be dealing with different technological advances. For instance, you could be comparing a 10-year-old method with a six-month-old method that could have different technologies. However, I would like to think that potential benefits of using meta-analysis outweigh the limitations. Allow me to expand. For instance, by doing meta-analysis, I was able to focus my FDA inspection on the issues with method number one, which included poor chromatography, instrument errors, and excessive internal standard response variability. The inspection was not conducted in silo. Usually, an inspection will focus on the bioanalytical operations of one company. But in this instance, by doing meta-analysis, I was able to co compare the bioanalytical operations among seven companies. So I had a pretty good idea of how method one performed. I like to think there's a high return on investment. I evaluated seven methods in one assignment. So the FDA may use that information in the future to determine whether or not a company owning one of those methods should be inspected. The second benefit is the industry outreach component. I visually and verbally shared meta-analysis results with the inspected company. Now these results did not include confidential information. The company was able to identify possible causes for the inspectional findings. While discussing the reason for high sample reanalysis, the company speculated that excessive internal standard variability could have originated from the brand of instrument they used and the ionization mode they used to measure the analyte. These were two factors that were different in method one from the other six methods. Moving forward, the company expressed interest in using a different brand of instrument and a different ionization mode to improve their method. Overall, I believe this is an example of how FDA could positively influence the field of bioanalysis through meta-analysis. Now we're just starting to scratch the surface on ways to better utilize bioanalytical data submitted to FDA. Moving forward, we may build a library of LCMSMS methods and perhaps branch out to in vitro and immunoassays. 
we may encourage FDA inspectors to conduct similar meta-analysis before inspections. And we may be able to share non-confidential information with the industry to help them refine or reaffirm the performance of their bioanalytical methods. With that, here's a question for your consideration. The graph displays individual results from low quality control samples among four methods. The vertical blue bar represents the bounds of acceptance criteria, that is plus or minus 15% deviation from nominal concentrations. From this graph, can you tell which method may have issues measuring low quality control sample concentrations? I'll wait a few seconds for answers to trickle in. Now time's up, the correct answer is method number three. If you notice many individual low quality control sample results fell outside of the acceptance criteria for method number three. This finding may indicate issues with the method's reliability to measure low quality control sample concentrations. I conclude my presentation by acknowledging the following FDA staff members, as well as the recently inspected company. I thank you for your attention and look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A panel.